everybody, welcome back to another episode of Conversations, the show where we have the conversations that help us stay in the conversations that matter. And I'm really excited to have my good friend Tim Sweet with me here today. And we're going to have a conversation that I think a lot of people want to focus on or a lot of people talk about, but maybe we're not talking about the right things in the conversation in order to make teamwork excellence, which is what we're talking about today, really come to life. So I think a lot of us have, I mean, whether you have worked in a corporate office before, or you've been a member of a sport team, or whatever kind of teamwork, um, maybe it's just even as your family, you put in some kind of teamwork. There's, there's always opportunities for us to participate with other humans together as a team. And there's a version of what that teamwork looks like when we would say that that is excellent teamwork. And there's versions of it where we're just like, Meh. or maybe is this even really teamwork? So we're going to have a really open conversation today about teams, what it looks like to participate together as teams, what it looks like to work together excellently as a team, and some of the other challenges that go along with that. So for those of you who are new to the show, this show is called Conversations for a Reason. It's got multiple people who are participating in thought and speaking together. So although you'll see me and Tim here today, this is a conversation for everybody. So if you're joining us live, please get in the chat and share with us your perspectives, your insights, your thoughts, your questions on the topic as we go through, because everybody has their own unique perspective of the conversation and every perspective is valuable and allows each and every one of us to grow and learn and which gives us more opportunity to create things like teamwork excellence. So we really encourage you guys to get in the conversation today. And before we could really jump into the conversation, let me introduce you to this gentleman, Tim, who is stroking his beard. <laughs> um, so Tim, can you give us a little introduction to who you are and why teams that work is something that you're so passionate about? Sure. No problem, Tracy. Um, so teams are, are something I'm passionate about because I'm passionate about seeing people fulfill their full potential through their professional pursuits. And, and typically that means working with leaders. And if leaders are able to fulfill their visions, it usually is because they've got a whole gaggle of people underneath them that are supporting them. And if those people are functioning in a high performance way, if they're connected, if they care about what they're doing, if they see their own purpose within it, uh, then amazing things can happen. And, and so, you know, I just think that if we're going to be at work for how, what a large portion of our lives it takes up, then what we deserve is we deserve to see the rewards of work. And we, and I think what that can be besides the value that we produce for others is what we get out of it. It's what, it's the juice that drives us. It's feeling like we left something bigger than ourselves that day at work. Um, and, and it just, it really excites me. And every time I work with a team and experience that leap forward even teams that have considered themselves high performance in the past it's exciting and so uh, i love to do it it's just it's what i'm here to do uh, i'm so excited about this because when you speak about people seeing their own purpose in something and and going to work and making a difference then one of the things that that always the words that always come up for me are contribution Right? Mm -hmm. that I'm making a contribution that matters to me, not just a contribution that matters to my boss or matters to my coworkers or matters to somebody outside of me, but that I'm making a contribution that matters to me. So I would love for to just start off with like fleshing out this, how, how do we even start to bring this into the conversation from a team perspective of mm. that everybody has their own contribution they're hoping to make their own purpose and how do we start to bring that to light knowing at the end of the day we're still a business we're here to make money um we're here to provide solutions in a specific area but how how can we start to bridge the gap and i mean i mean i think we do these things through conversation but how do we start to bridge mm -hmm. the gap um of making sure that we know that those contributing factors. No, absolutely. Um, I think 
Well, let's go back to what the primary problem here is. And we've seen this now uh, in stark relief in the last two years with COVID, with the uh, ongoing conversation around you know, work in person versus work remote versus hybrid workplace um, with people taking jobs, having never met their bosses uh, onboarding in very weird ways. And then people returning to the workplace, um, not sure if they want to be there anymore, not sure if they want to work with these people anymore because I've seen them in brand new ways. So the idea of contribution becomes, uh, you know, it's primary because not having it is so upsetting. Um, the, the, and upsetting is the right word. Think of it in terms of upsetting the balance or upsetting the apple cart. Um, when we look at someone's contribution, they can contribute professionally or they can, or the job itself can contribute to their own sense of self, their sense of worth, the, uh, how they want to live their lives. And if those two things are out of balance, and what I like to, to say is that, you know, we have personal success and we have professional success. And if those two things are not in sync, then what we have is the situation where a person is liquidating their sense of self, their their health in some cases, um, their time, which is so valuable, and they're liquidating it for the pursuits of the business, and then they start to feel resentment. The other direction is, and, and what we've seen lately, is when people want to claw back some of that uh, uh, benefit that they, that they see and try to bring things back into balance, or maybe want more than they're getting uh, that their current job is able to provide, we see the balance go the other way. And suddenly the business feels like it is getting a, a, a rough deal. It's getting a bad shake and, and starts to feel like uh, it's not seeing enough from the employee. And then we have, of course, performance issues and whatnot. But all of this stems from a, a feeling of scarcity in one area or the, or the other uh, and somebody losing out. Either the professional self loses out or the personal self loses out. And so one of the very first things that I do when we're dealing with this on a team level is I make sure that I go around and I understand what is each person in this for? What do, what are they really up for? What do they care about? And how do we achieve that through the work? Um, not not because of the work. So it's sort of, well, I get a paycheck and then I can go and hope I fulfill my needs outside uh, or it's perfectly matched um, because although a perfect position is, is there uh, it often takes a long time to find or to craft or create. Uh, and, and so you have to find ways to really feel fulfilled by the work in front of you often before perhaps you consider jumping out of a role take a look at uh, what do you need to do. So again, contribution is is everything, but think about it in two channels, right and left, personal self and professional self, and that we have to be contributing in both of those areas. Is that? Mm, yeah, I think this is, I mean, I, I would like to say that this is not the case and or this is not my experience, but my experience mm. is that like your personal self is for at home and your professional self is for at mm -hmm. the office. And so historically, when I was working in teams, there was always this, I mean, like you have water cooler chat and things like that, but there was very much a, this is the professional version. Leave it at the door. Yeah. yeah. And it's, I mean, I think during COVID, this has become a, more important topic of conversation because with people working at home, especially people with young kids and things like that, you're just like, well, I like, what, what am I going to do? <laughs> well, we, we runs in and splays himself against know, the door to hide from his dad. <laughs> we use the word work-life balance. I think that work is, is, is passe now. I think it's still appropriate because we're still balancing something, but we're really talking about work-life blend and, and how do these two things intermingle and co-mingle and we become stronger because of it. We become at one time more vulnerable, but also more available for people emotionally uh, because they appreciate us in these levels. And really high-performing teams understand what each other's goals are professionally and personally. Um, and, and I guess the other thing is we're talking in, in two channels, but to your point about being at home with the kids and things like this, um, really when we get into working with people in a coaching capacity, we're acknowledging all the different roles that that person plays. And so while I'm simplifying it down to work and personal, personal could include, you know, well, what other communities are you involved in? In my, for myself, it's, I'm involved in the dance community. I have to, I have to, I have to balance my leadership in that, in that area as a parent in the dance community. 
I am a father to my children. I'm a husband to my wife. Um, and others may have other affiliations that they need. Each one of these has its own moral construct. Each one of them has its own set of rules and transactional uh, type of benefit and relationship. And they look for different things from us. We have to be a different type of, of provider, contributor in each one of those areas. And so um, while I'm speaking about it, fairly simply in in two channels remember that it's sort of work and then however many others that you've got uh, in behind which poses poses its own uh challenge because if you're if you're too many things to too many people it can get awfully confusing and pretty draining if those right. things aren't syncopated so um yeah. but yeah no absolutely you know that professional self at work the days of the water cooler in that sense are are at one time long gone, but it'd be a good thing to talk about because it is one of the arguments uh, when we th say, you know, what do we miss out on when we, when we don't return to the office? There is a subtle human connection that happens when we stand in a room with a person uh, that isn't happening here between you and I in 2D. But when you and I are together in person, there's a, there's a, a real different, gravity to the to the experience and it lends itself to a lot of to a lot of uh subtle and unspoken human interactions just just presence that contributes to trust that contributes to empathy that contributes to uh you know the appreciation of authenticity it, it just it's a it's a totally different experience and so well i'm not arguing specifically that we should say everybody should return to work um we do have to engage in a conversation and it's going to develop over the next several years that says teamwork there are trade-offs for teams that are remote not that we want to get down into this rabbit hole but there are trade-offs mm -hmm. for teams that are fully remote versus trade off uh, that are in person um sometimes the trade-off is worth it but um that really we need to appreciate that in its fullness so we appreciate, you know, what babies are we throwing out with the bathwater and what new babies are coming into our lives? Um, yeah. Yeah. I think this is, it's interesting because, so like most of my corporate experience was mm -hmm. before COVID, right? So there was like, you just had in-person interaction, we would have potlucks and it was... I don't know. It was very interesting to think about it now because there was a lot of kind of forced team interaction that I don't think what contributed to the team dynamic and building relationships and those types of things. But there are some of those things. I just I always think of this one example and it's so weird, but I was just, I think it was just right after lunch or something. And there was a whole, a whole swack of us just hanging out in this like central kind of social area. And we started talking about um, roller coasters for whatever reason. And I, I black out on roller coasters. So okay. I don't really, I want to see the YouTube video. Oh my gosh. You're one of those, like the, the funnest people to watch on roller coasters are the one who black out. <laughs> um, it's not good for your brain. No, it's not. Brain. It's not. But no. it was so interesting because like I was the senior vice president of sales and marketing. I'm sharing the story about me blacking out on roller coasters. And there was this new employee in the development team who said the same thing. And he was like, oh my gosh, I black out on roller coasters too. And I was like, we never would have noticed. Like we never would have learned that that was something we had in common if we hadn't just been hanging out with a bunch of people I wouldn't necessarily choose to hang mm -hmm. out with. Right. And so there's stuff like that, that gets missed, but then there's also like, I, I know that Tim, you also do a lot of work and you have a lot of con commentary on team events, right. Yeah. And mm -hmm. quarterly events and things like that. And I would say that the majority of the team events that I attended didn't actually contribute to the building of team. Um, whereas like some of those other little things do. So in this new world of work from home, work from the office, hybrid work scenarios, like, again, I just feel like this is a thing that's important to, to it have is. as part yeah. of the conversation and to kind of like check the ego in saying like, this is what we've done for team events for forever. But if the point of a team event is to actually build team camaraderie or to team problem solve or 
fill in the gap of what a team event is actually supposed to be for, are we actually accomplishing that? Yeah. I mean, there are creative ways that people are finding to, to get close online. Um, and I mean, it is possible. And some of the teams that I'm working with virtually, they are using, they are using virtual playgrounds of some way, shape or form to get together and spend some downtime. Uh, but when people are spending so long online, they don't typically want their social time to be there as well. So there's that consideration. Uh, in the, in the area of events though, uh, those times that you take to connect as human beings, um, without the, the, the challenge of work. Now the challenge of work, the adversity that work brings the, the, the going and being in the trenches together is awesome for, for team building. Um, there's nothing that will, no river rafting trip is going to be as sustained and as applicable in context of work as the challenges that you, you point at the team while they are at work. So we, we can't, we can't mistake the fact that there is team building going on all the time when people are working, uh, collaboratively, but connecting to one another, uh, on a deeply human level, my personal feeling is that, teams that are seeking to be high performance are going to take, if they're going to a remote model are going to take any money that they're saving, uh, on, on, on having any, any, uh, money that they're saving on having a, a physical office and having people come into that and making sure that they're provisioned there. Uh, they're going to have to don't, they're going to have to allocate to creating very, very intense and deliberate, um, uh, spaces for human connection. Uh, some of the most interesting things that I'm seeing is a resurgence in, uh, particularly in the senior teams of vacationing together with the families. Uh, often uh, ourselves, we have a product that's coming out where it's uh, that we're going to far flung, flung tropical places with our senior management teams, where we do half day seminars for a, a period of a week. And every afternoon they are off expected to spend time with one another and each other's families and it's like an extended picnic um and and this is something that's becoming very very pop popular it's also something that's becoming increasingly affordable uh because it allow you you actually there's a benefit to being able to to write off uh, a vacation for um your employees uh so it's something that that carries some value uh seeing seeing entire companies rent um uh, cruise ships. I mean, it's like, there's, there's interesting things that are happening in this space, but the, the point is that where we don't have these small physical interactions, we're going to need to compensate in one way. If we want that level of closeness from our people, uh, if we want for them to actually sort of feel us on a different level and feel like they have that, that human connection, we have to remember that our brains, I mean, we are, we are wired as uh, in the same way that that our Paleolithic ancestors were. I mean, we are still looking for safety in numbers. We are still looking for the security that that brings. Just the feeling of having people around us, because we know now that our tribe is as big as is the tribe that could be coming to steal our our food. Um, we're still looking for tigers in the grass. We still default to to. Um, problem and threat areas uh, because we are scared very advanced apes but still scared apes and and so you know those 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 ancient portions of our brain are still in in full function and we can't deny those and some of those portions of our uh, genetic code are not being satisfied in a 2d relationship so you know uh, events are not dead in-person events are not dead uh, they're probably a lot more expensive than they were because you're flying people in from all over the place. Um, but you have to do it uh, if you want to be truly high performing, I believe. Um, I think that you can get close. I think you can get very, very close, but just that little bit extra. Well, and I think that, I mean, you talked about closeness, right? Mm -hmm. And if we're, if, if we're talking about creating closeness between teams, Mm -hmm. And that is being one of the contributing factors to having a high performing or teamwork excellence. Um, what are, I, I think it just makes me think that we, we, we have to go back to that original conversation <laughs> about what, because I feel like the things that create closeness 
for me aren't necessarily the same things that create closeness for you or the same mm. thing that create no. closeness for my team manager. So knowing those things about your people is, I mean, would you say that that's also a contributing factor to being able oh, to Oh yeah, and I think, closeness? Um, I've never used this word before, but you're inspiring it in me. You know, we can't think of this as a meal where we try to pack a, a box lunch for everything. We have to think about it as a smorgasbord. We have to think about it as, uh, you know, hundreds of dishes, some buffet line that everybody's going to find something that they like and that we probably should pick up and, and, and notice, you know, who's choosing the chicken and who's choosing the fish and who's got the vegetarian option and who's gluten-free. I mean, we probably should appreciate these things. I'm not talking about actually the food, but we need to appreciate people in that sense. And, and the biggest you know, shift for, for many is just to constantly remind yourself that, that you don't think the way that other people think. They don't feel the way that, that you feel about certain things. We have, we have stark differences that we can measure and we can plan around and we do. And those include, you know, what is this person's uh, work style? What is it? How does this person present themselves? How do they show up in terms of their genius at work? And then of course we've got the, the sort of run of the mill personality profiles that we use, which I think are, are useful, but also carry a brand new hazard in this digital age. And that is that they, they've they always formed a the, the dark side of personality profiles, besides the science, which, which we get in another time, which is problematic, is that they, they, they form a shortcut to knowing, knowing someone. And, and there's no shortcut to getting to know someone. Um, and so, you know, trying to classify somebody and assume that that means that you now understand how they think because they filled out some survey, I don't care how detailed, uh, is you may understand them a little bit better on the day, um, but it's it's no substitution for, for genuine connection. So, you know, that closeness and, and being together it, it, there's just no real substitution for it. But I think smorgasbord is the word that you left in my mind. And I think I'm going to keep using that because it really is, you know, how, how do you, how do you get into a position where you can do that? I mean, we also know that practically unless the, the sum total of your, of your business is four people, you, you might be able to hear some ev from everybody and have a pretty good conversation virtually. But as soon as it's greater than six or seven people, the, qu the quality of conversation that's even available online uh it 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 just isn't conducive to the the rate at which our brain wants to accept information about somebody else and when you're in person there is so much more stimuli there's so much more information getting through the barrier uh that that we can learn about people and we just have to really recognize that i think that there's a there is a challenge in person too though because i'm thinking mm -hmm. about like team events i've been at where the entire like when I used to work at the brick, we would have quarterly event and all 900 people <laughs> corporate mm -hmm. office would be in one space, mostly just hearing updates. Right. Mm -hmm. And the, the point is to like give every, everybody the upper, the floor and opportunity to speak, but the, it's not possible with that many people in the room. Yeah. Right. So, and, and even in some of the events that I've been with smaller groups of people, right? 65 or maybe even 20 people. And there's always, there's always the one, two, maybe three people who do the speaking. Yep. Right. And everybody else is just there to listen. But I think that this has to do with intention, right? Like yep. if our intention is to create closeness, then is closeness, created by the department heads just like standing at the front of the room and giving people a report right yeah. like that that might be necessary for part of it but that's not really accomplishing the closeness so then how are we like how are we creating that or what are the activities that we're doing that create closeness and it, especially if you're in a like fully digital working environment like what <laughs> Yeah. What are we doing to create that knowing that there is a challenge there? So timely conversation, because we are right now in the middle of uh, team building, strategic planning, offsite season. 
Um, and so this time of year, my business swings fully between now and say February, March, where it's just a, it's just filling spaces with, with teams that are wanting to do their one, two, three away days. Um, and, and when you, when you facilitate something like that, which is a huge part of my business, I coach, I advise, and I facilitate. And, and the facilitation is, is massive because when you're, when you have that natural populational, that populational, that national, that natural difference between people, and you have some people that really do want to uh, uh, be heard and are up there and are leading the conversation. You have everybody else that is hoping to get their, their word in. And you've got a, a large number of people who are quite happy to sit back and, and listen and wonder about what's going on and, and, but not necessarily contribute. You need structure, you need um, flexibility, you need intention to your point to really bring everybody into center. And so as a professional facilitator, we, we work carefully at uh, seeing what the outcomes are that we want from this, this time together, both casual and professional, and then working those into a program, both during the time around a boardroom or in a workshop space and what's happening uh, on the, in the downtime and the collision spaces that are outside the room and and we make sure that we are getting everybody involved and leaving no one behind um not for you know the least well the even the the most important reason to do that is because the time you emerge from one of these sessions you're usually centered around some new vision for the team or for the strategy or for something and we have to have everybody fully engaged in that before we leave the room and and People need to understand that in a virtual session, it becomes even harder to do, though. I will say our business has become much better at doing it over the last three years because we've been doing it collaboratively. It can still be done. We, our, our approach personally is to break it up into several uh, micro sessions simply because we need people up all the time. Um, but you do miss out on those one-on-one -on -one conversations where everybody gets a chance to talk and, and whatnot. So, making sure that everybody is participating fully, make sure that making sure that we get a chance for everybody in the room to shine at some point, um, making sure that there isn't, there's a curse behind uh, a leader standing up and setting the tone or the department heads to your point up, uh, standing up and just telling everybody how it's going to be, because then really what we're doing is it's an informational download. It's not actually a collaborative session. You're not asking, asking anybody to co-author anything. And as a result, um, it really, that becomes an exercise and here's what we're going to do. And, you know, everybody with us. So it, that can get a little dangerous and that has to be managed properly. Not to say it isn't always appropriate. Sometimes you've got a brand new team where the core group of visionaries is say the founders or something along those lines. And it really becomes that first level setting. But even then there's a chance for everybody to pick it up, really handle it, why is the mission of this company important to me? And can I tell that to everybody else so they can get some insight into how I succeed through being a part of this company and they can stand up for me the same way I'm going to stand up for them. And, mm -hmm. and so it can be a really, it can be a really great experience, but it has to be, it has to be intentional. And there is a great difference between the skills of different facilitators and their experience level. And there's a big warning sign here. A lot of people try to try to DIY this. They try to bootstrap it. And if I can say one thing to the people that are listening today, it's that be careful of that because the minute that you have to be running the meeting, you're no longer a full participant in the meeting. And um, this is what, I used to say this all the time about taking minutes as well, yeah. right? Is that like I would go to a management meeting and then I would be responsible for taking the minutes. And I'm like, well, that's fine i can't, i'm capable of doing that but i can't fully participate in the conversation if i'm responsible for taking the minutes yeah. so do you want do you need me to be fully participatory in this because if so then we should have someone else come and take the minutes yeah somebody uh, who doesn't need to participate <laughs> a facilitator should take you 10,000 30,000 feet over where you usually operate uh and it should it should have you arriving in destinations that would be hard to get to if you were on your own. And, 
And that's the feedback that I get consistently is that how do we get up to such a level where everybody's able to take a moment to work on the business, not in the business. And typically when teams uh, want to run these away days for themselves, inevitably they get back to, you know, a measure of the same old, same old. There's too much gravity around from what we've been doing to, to break free of it. And so my job is to really disrupt in the moment. And at the same time, allow not just the divergent conversation, but the convergent conversation where, where we have um, no thought left behind, where we are able to see the different thought that people are having, no matter how quietly spoken, and make sure that we honor that and we bring it into the middle and we, we incorporate it. And often that means for a facilitator, you have to have a deep toolbox uh, because you may call an audible and decide that in the middle of the meeting, you're not getting to the outcomes that you wanted to have. And there's some dynamic going on that you, you didn't appreciate moving in and, and that you need to find a better way to do something in the moment. And after 25 years of doing that, I find I can really play with something. It's like jazz and okay, we're, you know, we're on a different time signature now. We better go this way. And I'm going to pick up the trombone when I thought I was going to be playing the sax and there we go. Um, but it's it's moving with the team. It's a dance. It's not it's not a march, and um, and and really making sure that everybody has a chance to to be part of that and, and show their show their flair, you know. Yeah. Um, well, and I want to just tie into what Lisa is, is sharing here about that closeness and feeling comfortable with each other. Hi, Lisa. Because um, I feel like there's. I mean, if, if someone asked me to rate my level of comfort um, mm. with some of the teams that I have been a part of in the past, I would be like, yeah, sometimes I would have been that person who just like sits there and and doesn't say anything. Um, I've been in like a, um, I was on a board when uh, I was just the secretary because I was like, I don't want to be responsible for making decisions. I'll just come and take the notes. Um, but then they were starting, they were talking about marketing and making this marketing investment. And I was like, this is going to be a terrible idea. And they kept waiting for somebody else to say that it was going to be a terrible idea. And they got to the point where like they were going to vote. And I'm like, crap, they're going to vote for this. And it's a terrible way to invest the members money. So mm -hmm. now I have to say something. Yeah. Um, and uh, like at that, that was the moment where I was like, okay, I have to get comfortable with this team because I have, like, I feel like I'm being called to share my expertise, but I've also been part of teams. I think I've shared this on the show before where people have been just like, <laughs> like the CEO of the company is just like demolished a person in yeah. public in front of yeah, everybody. Yeah. And so then you're like, well, yeah, I'm going to get close to this guy. <laughs> Not that, to get close to that guy. Well, and, and it, it was even more so for me, like one, because I was actually, I still am a huge fan of that guy for being like yeah. brave enough to provide his actual feedback in front of everybody and then being condemned for it in front of everybody. Yeah. But what yeah. it taught everybody else is that like, unless you agree with the CEO, don't give your feedback publicly because this is what will happen. <laughs> Right. And then, and then, and then, you know what? Virtual will work fine because we've got a one, we've got a marching order and go in and do. And, right. and, and to be frank, there's a lot of businesses that are tremendously profitable doing that. The question is, there's a difference between profitability and high performance. And usually it can be felt in the closeness of people. I, one word that we're dancing around here, and I think, uh, well, I don't think intentionally dancing around it, but I'm just going to use it, is it, it boils down to trust. And and there are building blocks to trust. And if a team doesn't have a measure of trust going into these collaborative sessions, you aren't going to get the results you could have potentially. Um, and so usually I'll, I'll, if there is a trust break within an organization, if we know it's there, uh, or if I, if I, through the pre-work, if I, if I spot it, um, which I will, um, if it's there, <laughs> I won't create it. Uh, but no, trust becomes job one. Uh, we get okay. back to the fact that you know what we need. We need to have everybody feel that they they can choose to to speak up, um, and also we have to feel that constructive criticism is is an open avenue uh, if it's constructive and if it can be received uh, 
with the spirit in which it's given and be and be productive and not be and not be something that's going to um cause trauma and 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 shut other people up right so so um you know we we're using the word closeness closeness i think that's different from proximity um but i think uh all both of those things are also different well i think more appropriately we're mostly concerned with trust and can we establish can we establish the trust we need in order to be part of the dance and and um do all the high flying moves think of it like a high performing team would be one that's tossing people up in the air and having to catch them versus somebody that's just going to be doing the the high school you know hand on waist hand on shoulder rock back and forth okay that's that is dancing kind of you know um but it's not the same as something that's really integrated with the music and mm -hmm. and and is well thought out so uh, closeness so, proximity trust all important points yeah and i i want to just also recognize that linkedin user is sharing with us a group think is a productive team killer mm -hmm. um and it, it, this is the thing right so maybe let's let's wrap up our conversation on this point today tim is there sure. a level of risk that's required from both like a team perspective and a leadership perspective to get into that high performing team level the teamwork excellence to get from like if we're going to call it teamwork grade nine dance part versus level, yeah <laughs> versus, versus dancing with the stars the, like yeah this the swing flipping tossing all of that like uh shebang because uh, to me it sounds like there's a level of risk here that's involved yep. but if we're if we're not comfortable enough with that level of risk then we can't actually go to that there level. is a ladder of of a ladder of achievement or a ladder of maturity that a team can go through and each one of those rungs represent a risk um each one of them require that people uh acknowledge uh, they have to be open for certain things now look again in working with a team, working with its members individually and together, um, the job is to progress people up through those. And we and an organizational development specialist, I mean, what we do is have the tools and the conversations uh, either created in the moment, invented in the moment, or tools at the ready because we discern the situation we understand what's happening and then we're able to say okay this individual needs this to advance to the next rung and we de-risk that climb and when we think of what risk is from an actuarialist perspective i mean risk is the threat that something awful is going to happen but there's an equal measure of risk that if we don't take the next climb that we're going to fail to capitalize on an opportunity and for us, and now we're going full circle back to the idea of personal and and uh, professional courage, right? Uh, by giving into one of those things, by protecting ourselves professionally, we may give up an opportunity to grow personally, and thereby actually constrain the benefit we get out of the 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 the, the role and membership in the team, and that will shorten. Our, our time that we want to be with that team and our patience for it. Um, likewise, if we, if we take too many risks professionally, we're likely going to, we're going to give up opportunity. Um, pardon me. If we take too many risks per personally, we may give up opportunity professionally. So, so helping people understand who they are, how they work, what they can, what they can lean on as their top strengths and as their, areas of genius and what they can forgive themselves and be and be unashamed of having say less than proficient uh areas of, of how they operate but still you know what do i lean on okay i'm not the best at that but i know that through my team i can find support because they're better at that than i am so i mean every climb on that ladder represents risk and and organizational development is about making each rung more and more accessible to people. And I guess the one point that I would say that's really interesting here is we have very, very dismal numbers when we look at the overall population, how many people have actually experienced high performance individually and, and on a team. 
And so some people have never been to the upper reaches of that ladder. It's like they're, they're through a cloud and they don't know how high they can actually climb. And, and so unless you've been there and then you enter a team that might be lower than you were uh, uh, used to, then you can, you have the opportunity to pull everybody up with you. Um, but often, you know, you don't know what you're capable of. None of us do. I don't at some points. I have, I have mentors that, that take me to the next level constantly. That ladder is endless. And, um, and every, every rung is a glorious risk. It's a risk that's going to take you up to the, to a next level of achievement. And by the time you're on it and you're confident on it, you're going to look back down and you're going to go, okay, yeah, if I can climb this high, what's next? So yeah, uh, risk is it. We are creatures. This is the other great thing about being human beings living on a rock that's hurtling through space. Uh, we are creatures of risk and we, and we need to embrace that. Every one of us though processes it differently and, and, and uh, we have the capacity to move up, but each one of us have, have different things we need to see to get there. So get, get fluent, get fluent people in, in what it means to advance yourself and what you can lean on. And there's all sorts of power that comes in that. Uh, and it just, I mean, if most of you guys, you know me and, and the creator of the Your Business Peeps community, right? And this is one of the- Member. <laughs> Tim is a member. <laughs> um, but this is one of the, the things that I consistently come back to when it comes to work is like, who are, who are the people that you have that are those people who can lift you up the ladder, right? Mm -hmm. are, are we focusing in our organizations on creating leaders that have this capacity to, to even realize their, their access to that, right? Because no matter how high we climb, even for CEOs of really big organizations, right? They have mentors, they have people around them that show them where they can go and help them get there. And are we creating these opportunities? Are we looking for those opportunities? As an individual employee, are you looking for those people? Because my experience is that I, I had no intention of looking at team that way. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't like part of my conversation when I was in corporate. So as much as I, as a leader, found it important to create a supportive work environment for my employees to continually find safe ways to take that risk to go up the ladder. I didn't have that for me. Like nobody was creating that for me and I wasn't going and looking for it for me. I was actively going and creating it for other people. And so I think it just is so important to keep that in the conversation of that everybody deserves that wherever you are on the ladder. Yep. You deserve peeps. <laughs> there, there is a portion of the population who do not aspire to anything greater and who want to go in and do a good job, uh, typically. And they want to um, do the time, get paid for the time, very transactional. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but the group that you and I are talking to are, talking to are the achievement-focused group. Uh, they are the group that have, they have something to accomplish in this world. And, you know, gosh darn it, they're going to do it. And, um, you know, within that group, there is such a wide variety of, of who we are and how we show up and, and what that climb looks like that everybody, if you're in that achievement group, you deserve to have the opportunity to grab the next ladder and climb. You deserve to have as much of a vision as you can on, on what rung you're trying to get to and just how many cloud layers that's above you. And, uh, and you deserve to have a way of getting there that's tailored to your journey, not to, not to anyone else's. Um, we see a lot of should books, a lot of, of, of uh, how to succeed books that, are, that were great for the author a great method for the author and, and they can give us great ideas, but nobody's journey is the same. And, and everyone here deserves to, to grab it, grab onto it, see themselves through and do it in a way that's going to make the most of their strengths and mitigate their weaknesses and be comfortable in that the entire time and just be able to 
it's jazz, baby. So just be able to pick up your best instrument and, and riff because, you know, at some point, if you're, if you're seeking achievement, you are going to be asked to do a solo. And when that moment comes, is it going to be awesome or is it going to be a screecher? And uh, uh, I want it to be awesome. For everybody out there, I want your time in the spotlight to be, to be awesome. And I want that to last as long as possible because there's, there's just there's so much potential out there. We are such a beautiful machine, such an amazing animal. And, and to... And to cut ourselves short uh, is it's just such a shame. There's no need to do it. So, And especially if we are the ones doing the cutting ourselves short, <laughs> right? Because like, that has happened to me before. Yep. Mm -hmm. And even I, I, I think about this quite often is that I had my experience in corporate and it was my experience, totally valid. But if I knew some of the things I knew now, how could that have been different? How could I have looked at that differently? You've seen, yeah, you've seen in our, yeah, you've seen in our material, um, one of our programs, the work cell program, we equate job fit to a tight pair of jeans. We're the ones trying to squeeze into those 501s. We're the ones that maybe have become a little too thick to make them comfortable. You know, we're the ones that are, that are, that are picking the wrong rise or, or whatever the measure is. But, often nobody else is asking us to put on this incredibly tight pair of jeans and try to get it buttoned up, but that's what we do. And, and as a result, we suffer. And so, um, you don't know, really find that fit, uh, with everything that you do and, and you deserve it. That's, is you're worth it. It, there's no other way to say it, <laughs> Don't. but you know, you are often the one trying to put on the, the tight pair of jeans. So again, get a little more fluent on what the best pair of jeans looks like. Yeah. Well, and let's just tie this back to the concept of teamwork excellence, right? Because sure. now I'm imagining a whole bunch of people in a change room. <laughs> this is probably inappropriate for a team activity, but a whole bunch of yes. people in a change room <laughs> trying to squeeze into jeans that don't fit them. Sure. Right. This is not the formula for teamwork excellence. <laughs> Yeah. And so there's a level of, we, we talked a lot about closeness, but the, the thing that keeps coming up to me on that too, is just like, how, how much intention, how much effort do I put into knowing my team, right? Mm. Like, can I see that this person is struggling to put on this pair of pants? Can I, can I create a space that allows them to realize that they don't have to put on that pair of pants? And yeah. if, if we have all of us, even in the leadership, trying to fit into these boxes that aren't, not that you have to have everything that's like completely custom fit for you, but this is like not close to fitting you, then how much, how much effort energy are we spending trying to fit into this yeah. when we could be having the conversation about like, who are we? How do we create a space where we fit together being who we are? And how do we optimize that instead of all the other things? There are hundreds of conversations that the average team needs to have. And, and when we look at teamwork excellence, it's not single faceted. Um, we have to look at the, the, we have to look at the abilities of the leader. We have to look at, you know, does lead, does leader have capacity and capability to lead in the way that, they want to lead. We have to look at the engagement of the people and are they connecting to the team and the work and the strategy in ways that make sense. We have to look at the, the operations, the work design itself. Do we have the right technology? Do we have the right processes? Do we have the right skills in the room? And we have to look at the strategic point of the team. Is the team suited to go and pursue what it's being asked to pursue? Uh, or is it being asked to pursue the wrong thing and no matter what good job it does, it's never going to have value because it, they're pointed at the wrong thing. And then there's all the interchange in between. And that is where the magic happens. That is where we find uh, actually measurable attributes that we can say, here is where we need to have a conversation. Here is where we need to launch, um, you know, an effort and bring people together. And so um, if we think about it 
in terms of a series of small decisions, but the right decisions, the, the prioritized decisions, a series of small conversations, but the right conversations, it suddenly becomes more accessible and people become more willing because for each one of those properly appreciated things that we're going to go and chase, not because we should, but because they're the right thing for that team in the moment, suddenly we see amazing leaps forward in team capability and people feel it. They feel a difference at coming to work. They feel more joyous coming to work. They feel more energy from being on that team. And that's a, that's a self perpetuating, you know, virtuous cycle that suddenly now I'm more and more willing to have these provided we do the work to get to what's the right thing to talk about today. And we don't clutter it with everything. We say, this is what we're going to focus on. This is what we're going to change by the end of this seminar. This is what we're going to go and work on for the next three weeks. And this is how we're going to materially shift the performance of the business. And that in my mind is teamwork excellence. You get a, you get a team that is a team built up of the right people focused on the right work with the capacity to achieve excellence. And that capacity is growing. And that train is just moving faster and faster and faster. And you know it when you're on that train. Uh, it's a little harder to appreciate when you're still at the station. But but it's when you've been on a high-performance team, there's nothing like it. And um, they're the, they're the t they're, they are the leaders and the teams that we never leave and we never forget. I had a teammate from, from a role that I was in years ago and she just came, she's here right now actually, but she just, she just came and joined us from, from Australia and, um, and the same team that and this is over 10 years ago assembled. And it's just like old times because we were operating on such a level, you know, we're talking about, it's the Beatles, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's, it, we're just at a different level of, 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 of performance and knowing one another and, and loving one one another, which is a whole nother conversation, but but really getting down to that French Plutonic love, but really getting down to that deep care for for each each other as a person and as the professional. And when you achieve that, it, it's just it it's what I'm here to build. So. Uh. I got to do an episode on like love at work. <laughs> totally. I mean, I'm totally it's one of my favorite on love on the balance sheet is what we say. How do you put love on the balance sheet? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, and this is the thing we're not going to start on that topic for today because we're nope. running out of time, but nope. I think this is the thing. And one of the things I always appreciate about these conversations is that we come and we have a topic about teamwork excellence. And then we get to the end of the conversation. And you're like, wow, that is actually like, there's not one thing. There's not just one thing we need to do. There's not just one way one person needs to show up, right? Like this is a complex combination of activities and yeah. it's important to know that, right? Yes. It's important. If, if we make it one dimensional, it might sound simpler in terms of yes. yeah. implementing a fix. But at the end of the day, when we're talking about the human experience and multiple humans, experiencing each other <laughs> in a variety of ways it's just not that simple and it's, so it is complex. we open the can of worms <laughs> yep. it's complex um but by navigating through that through line the the individual steps are actually quite simple and they're and they're and they're not difficult uh if it is broken and chunked down into the appropriate steps and and again that's where you need the the skill set either internally or or sourced that that helps you pick the through line uh, and, and not getting overwhelmed with, with everything there is to change and everything there is to do. It's there to do, but it's about finding the first thing to do and then building on that and building on that and building on that. Um, because you don't, the, the, I used to be a chef, you know, this, um, what's the first, what's a, a chef learns how to fry an egg properly. And he learns what that means. And when a chef knows what that means, they can, they can, they never forget. And by the way, they never stop. It's not like frying an egg becomes easy. It's just that they, it becomes habitual to, to know how to treat an egg. And then you build on that knowledge and you appreciate, well, how does, how does this, how do these philosophies work when we're talking about asparagus or salmon or, 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 or a bechamel or whatever you're making, um, 
but it's just the conscientiousness behind it, the, the awareness that it's there in building simple skills, building simple capability in rapid succession so that you can take something that looks like it's very complex and, and very overwhelming and break it down into its constituent steps. And, and so, yeah, complex, absolutely. Achievable, 100%. Break it into its simplest possible factors and, and get moving. Yeah. Ah, and you gotta take gotta take the first step, right? Like this is one of the things that I always see coming out of these conversations is that it's I'm so glad that we had this conversation today. And thank you, Tim, yeah. for sharing all of your expertise and everybody in the chat as well who shared your perspectives. And this one conversation might be a step. But if we don't take any other steps, we just showed up today. And although we appreciate you showing yeah. up today, we want you to take more steps, right? To to explore what does what does teamwork teamwork excellence look like? Do yeah. we feel like we're exploring? Do we feel like we're experiencing that right now? Do we feel like we're not experiencing that? How can I participate in that? Because as a member of the team, all of us have a way that we can contribute or not contribute to teamwork excellence. So being part of the conversation and staying in the conversation is what actually allows us to get to that achievement where we're up in the clouds at the, the highest level, level of the ladder. Um, and it, it doesn't, we don't just shoot to the top of the ladder by participating in one conversation. It takes an ongoing investment into the conversation to make that happen. So Tim, right before we finish off for today, like if people want to stay in this conversation, what is the best way to get connected with you and to learn a little bit more about what your company, Teamwork Excellence, um, does to participate in this conversation? Sure. I'll give you a couple of things. Uh, the first thing is I would say, reach out and DM me, uh, uh, connect with me, follow me, hit the bell on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm at Sweet Leadership on LinkedIn. That's the the easiest way to get in touch with me. Uh, if you want to visit the the website, easiest way to get there is twe.team, twe.team. Uh, check out the forward slash solutions. You're going to get an idea of pretty much everything that we do. And you'll see a link on every one of those pages which will take you to TWE slash TWE.team slash discovery, which is going to allow you to book 30 minutes with me, uh, you know, no strings attached. And we can just talk about what, what, where are you in your journey, either as a leader of a team or a professional on a team and where do you want to go? And, and then I will either present some solutions or I'll put you into touch with people that I think can help you. So that would be the way to get in touch with me. Make sure you know, and maybe you guys are just in exploring this right now, but I think one of the, again, the, the other places where we, we lose our clarity is where do we want to go, right? Like maybe we're not happy with where we're at right now, but we don't know where we're going. Um, so that, that's a, quite honestly, that's a fun conversation. I love to participate. Well, and, <laughs> and I'm going to, I'm going to counter here and there's one other place you can find me. And that's that's as part of the peeps. So, Tracy, why don't you drop that on people, please? <laughs> Your business peeps community is a place to explore these types of things, right? Like it, it's been created because I know that not everybody is part of these types of conversations. Mm -hmm. And we don't always know where we're going. We don't always know where what we think, what our experience is, what we want to do based on where we're at right now. And so the Your Business Peeps community, we're almost at 100 members, you guys. So there's really great opportunity just to connect with people and explore through conversation. Ground floor, baby. Where do I want to go, right? Yeah. What do I want to do? And there's no right or wrong answer. This is not a thing in Your Business Peeps. It's not like, Tracy and Tim are going to tell you that this is the exact steps that you need to take or the exact same steps that everybody takes to get to the level. Right? Yeah, we like, don't shit about, on people there. No shooting. No, no shooting allowed. <laughs> it's about helping you explore what is right for you. Where do you want to go? And, and then being a supportive teammate yep. that will help help you get there. Surround yourself with your peeps so that you can get to where you want to go, not where I say you should go. I, I won't say that because I don't believe in that. Um, but it's, yeah, it's just about being surrounded by your peeps. So come, if you got, I know some of you in the chat are already members. If you're not already a member, reach out to me. Happy to share more about it. We have no pitch networking events that happen twice a month. So you get to kind of like test out 
what are these people like and what do they talk about? Um, how do they explore through conversation? Um, it's just a really great opportunity to have your test out using your voice and figuring out what it is that you want to say and what you want to do. Um, so thank you for that, Tim, for the little, the little plug for the peeps. No problem. Um, <laughs> With that, you guys, we are going to wrap it up for today. Thank you so much for participating in the conversation. As I mentioned, please stay in the conversation. Connect with me. Connect with Tim. We'd love to be in conversation with you, especially about how you can accomplish teamwork excellence so that you can feel like you're making your contribution and not just some random contribution. Um, and come, we will not be here next week because I am moving. <laughs> so I will be fully in move mode. So we will not have this live next week, but we do have a permission to do you conversation series installment on Monday. It's about bringing your personal brand to work. Um, so if you are excited to enter into the conversation about how you can bring more of your personal brand to work with you, then please there's a LinkedIn event for that one as well. So sign up for that. Um, come and check it out. We would love to um, have some more conversation about how you can do that. And bring your personal manager to work. Um, thank you, everybody, again. Tim, always a pleasure, my friend. Thank you for having me, And, and until next time, everybody, permission to do you.